Okay, thank you so much. Um, welcome to our afternoon session of the second day of Dancing with the Art World. Um, uh, you are here f now for uh, The Lives of Dances, a conversation with Simone Forti and Yvonne Rayner, which is being moderated today by Julia Bryan Wilson. Julia Bryan Wilson is the associate professor, as an associate professor of, of modern and contemporary art at the University of California, Berkeley. She is the author of Art Workers, Radical Practice in the Vietnam War Era, and editor of the volume Robert Morris, forthcoming this summer from MIT Press in the October Files series. She was the recipient of the 2013 College Art Association Art Journal Award for her article, Invisible Products. Julie's essay on learning Trio A, entitled Practicing Trio A, which we just saw, was published in the summer 2012 issue of October. She is also a frequent contributor to our forum. And it is with great pleasure that I welcome Julia Bryan Wilson. Thank you. and sit. for inviting me. It's a tremendous honor to be on the stage with these two incredible women. Um, and I wanna, I'm going to be very brief in my introductions. I could go on and on because they're so incredibly accomplished, as I'm sure many of you know. But I really, um, um, I really want to just dive into the conversation part. So I'm going to take my role. I, I'm, I'm hoping to be very, um, take a light touch with my moderation and really engage. Hopefully, you two will engage each other. The audience will play a role in the conversation as well. So just quickly, um, Simone Forti, who was born in Italy, is now an LA-based choreographer, dancer, and musician, whose work with improvisation, objects, sounds, and found movement has been widely recognized as significant for the development of postmodern dance. Her early works from 1960, such as Seesaw and Roller, helped break the boundary between happenings, sculpture, installation, and dance. She is the author of Handbook in Motion from 1974, and is the recipient of numerous awards, including a Bessie, a Lester Horton Lifetime Achievement Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Simone has exhibited her work in venues such as MoMA, MOCA, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London, and here at the Hammer, to name a very small sample, and has led workshops and classes all around the world. A native Californian, Yvonne Rayner is a MacArthur Award-winning choreographer, dancer, and filmmaker who trained under Martha Graham, among other figures. In, in the 1960s, Yvonne co-founded Judson Dance Theater, the seminal New York space for minimal and postmodern dance, and later helped form the improvisation group Grand Union. Her films have garnered such prizes as the Teddy, which is the award for the best queer film at the Berlin International Film Festival, the Sundance Filmmakers Trophy, and the Independent Slash Experimental Film and Video Award from the Los Angeles Film Critics Asso oh, Association. She's the author of several books, including her brilliant and moving autobiography, Feelings Are Facts, A Life. Yvonne recently retired from UC Irvine, where she was a distinguished professor at the Claire Trevor School of the Arts, and I know she will be deeply missed. So I want to um, just start by reading a, a kind of prompt that Ryan and Brennan gave me when thinking about this panel, which is the following kind of deceptively simple questions. Where do dances live? The museum, the company repertoire, repertory, the archive, the bodies of dancers, the memory of audiences, other artists' practices, what is at stake in these differences? And I wanted to um, maybe just have Huddle and Trio A act in some ways as a kind of cake as case studies for the questions of the lives and the afterlives of dance, because here we are talking about the institutionalization in some way of dance, and I think one of the very profound questions that arises is the status of documentation, the condition of memory, and also the projection 
uh, into the future, so also the question of legacy. So I just kind of wanted to begin by having maybe um, each of you, sorry, talk a little bit actually about these Precise, these exact images. So what we're looking at is um, an image of Huddle that I, uh, was at the Brishnikov Art Center, I believe, on the left, and an image of the, the film of Trio A on the, from 1978 on the right, as it is projected in the show at MoMA Online, curated by Connie Butler. So in a, a context, a gallery context. <laughs> Well, I'll start. Um, I, I, I've been pondering the question for a few seconds now about where does dance live, and I was thinking different dances live differently, and, and they live in many different ways, but mainly in the moment when a dance is being danced or dancing is happening, uh, living in the person who's dancing and also in the witnesses who are watching and also, I think, identifying with the sense of movement and, and feeling the movement. So um, I think it's, a, a first of all, experiential. Experiential for the body of the dancer and the body of the audience in the moment of the, first, the presentation in live space. Yes, in the body and in the sense of space and the sense of shape, of, of, of style, of, yeah, but in the moment. Well, I, I think I wanted to also mark that you two have actually really very different formations um, and that you're sometimes categorized together, or at least your work in the 60s is put in under some of the same rubrics, but that, Simone, you really were working very much coming out of happenings and trained as a painter, and Yvonne, really someone within and among the dance world and taking classes in ballet and Afro-Cuban dance. I mean, really thinking hard about the questions of dance. And so it's interesting to me how there's formal, there might be some formal similarities or you were in the same milieu, but from some different streams converging. I'm, I'm going to just say that I, I was not coming out of happenings. I, I did have a, a well, five years involved with the happenings, but that was after, a, after the, this period of making these dances, and that was mainly coming from having worked with Anna Halpern intensively for four years. Which I know you both did. I knew that when I took on this, I thought, this is going to be an experience of being corrected. <laughs> well, so well, we're doing it together. We're doing it together. It's, it's interesting to me that we're more or less the same age, and you were influenced by Anna, who came out of a, a kind of traditional modern dance mm -hmm. milieu in Wisconsin, and uh, uh, and yet by the time you were uh, performing, uh, studying with her, she was rapidly going on to something else, influenced by Cage and other uh, and, uh, musicians, contemporary music. And, uh, yeah. And, and I think also Bauhaus, through, Bauhaus. through her uh, husband, uh, right. Lawrence Halper, um, um, a landscape architect, mm -hmm. and um, I think her, her process of teaching, her workshop process was close to what was happening in art mm -hmm. schools and influenced mm -hmm. by Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. But then when, when we met in 1959, we were both studying for you for some strange reason at the Graham School, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and we met through a mutual friend, Nancy Meehan, who also came from San Francisco and had gone to uh, uh, New York to try and be in the Graham Company. And uh, there was a short, the, a summer where we, the three of us would improvise together. So, uh, you and I met from uh, already this change in thinking about modernism and modern dance was there, and uh, we came at it from different influences, but then converged uh, with everything that was happening in New York in, in the 60s, the early, late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to um, go back to this image, Yvonne, and just ask you about um, your thoughts about a work like Trioway being presented in this kind of situation. So as a 
projection. Yeah, this kind no, of I'm sorry. The, the, yeah, yeah, in the art. Because, oh, oh, I mean, it, it was not only a film, an installation that was mm, a projection mm, um, of this film, but then Pat Catterson did also dance in front of that projection. So yes. Yes, there was many modalities. Ah, uh, well, this gets into a kind of can of worms in a category. Open it, open it. A, a category <laughs> called uh, Biting the Hand That Feeds You. Um, uh, yeah, I wasn't there. Pat told me this experience she had. Uh, the curator uh, had wanted uh, the spectators to walk through it while she was doing it. And uh, um, I mean, this brings up this kind of disconnect for certain kinds of work. This might be quite appropriate, but for this dance, which is totally frontal, it works best with the audience on one side, um, and it's all about the gaze and uh, avoiding the gaze of the audience. And so um, with people walk, I, I don't know, it, she got her way, and uh, the audience was crammed, uh, stacked, standing uh, 10 deep on one side. And, uh, it, it was not the best way to view the... Uh, I don't mind, you know, that film being shown, but, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> what else do you want to know about that? <laughs> I, well, I think it's interesting to think about how a frontal dance translates into a gallery space where the idea of where the spectator lives is much more mobile, you know, and much more temporary in some ways, yeah. I want to, I mean, I think um, just because you brought up Anna Halperin, she just had a little show at the Berkeley Art Museum in conjunction with the performance of Parades and Changes. And it was basically a series of, it was pulled from the archives of the Berkeley Art Museum. So there were letters, diagrams, notes, what really we would call ephemera in some ways um, in vitrines. And very few photographs, actually. And this is one life of dance in the museum, actually, is a, you know, a collection of the ephemera that it generates in terms of promotional posters or flyers, programs, etc. Um, and both of you, I'm sure, have experienced this, that the, the dance is one aspect, but then there's all the other documentation that somehow stands in for that or suggests it in some way. And I'm curious how you feel about that or what you make of that as a phenomenon. Well, I, I, when I come across it um, and, and see information about something that happened in the past, I'm glad to look at it. And, and, and I don't feel like I saw the work, mm -hmm. but um, I'm seeing what I'm seeing, and I'm happy to see it. And, and it, 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 it does give me something. Um, I think different pieces um, lend themselves better to that. Than others. Um. Yeah, it's up to the uh, curator, historians, archaeologists to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, uh, mm -hmm. I, I have nothing against that. I mean, I, even the little bit of Nijinsky that you can get online mm -hmm. has meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes a photograph, even a photograph that's that's not that clearly visible anymore, or that, that wasn't taken with such high quality um, equipment can give you so much information, or at least can stir some, some, something in your thinking and in your, in your vision uh, that's valuable. Yeah. I had a, a student who wrote a kind of scathing critique of that show because it was, it was really just a wall and a vitrine and she really thought it was basically kind of, it wasn't appropriate for a museum context or it wasn't appropriate to, as a show, as an exhibit. It was more like these are research materials that one could peruse at the art in an archive in a more fruitful way. But I reminded her that I had just had an email from a PhD student in London who was flying specifically to see this tiny you know, set of materials because it was a treasure trove to her. And that stuff doesn't actually circulate the way that you think it is. It's not available on the internet. You know, it does exist still in file folders and basements, etc. So, yeah, I think it's, it, it's important to realize not everyone has the same access to those things. You know, they're very, it it's, can be kind of arbitrary where those things are held. I found myself the other day uh, YouTube being Pavlova. There are Little clips of her dying swan. Oh. Yeah. Mm. 
I, this is a little bit of an awkward setup because I'm showing you things that you can't see. So I'll just um, tell you that what we're looking at is um, Simone's slant board from 1961, although the photograph you're seeing is actually not from 1961. It's from an early 80s performance in Amsterdam, um, which I have some questions about. And then also uh, We Shall Run from 1963 at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford. 65. I, see, I knew this, was, but I really, I really think it was, it was not, but this is performance was 65? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I knew this oh, was. Oh, the dance was, the dance was Judson in 63. Okay, okay, sorry. The dance was Judson. <laughs> I decided to take out the dates. I think it said that. It probably said both dates. Oh, you got that from uh, the Getty? They have everything wrong. <laughs> John Tane, John Tane is here in the audience. So Simone, I have a question for you, which is I asked, I, um, this is my figure one for this anthology I'm doing, uh, I've just finished on Robert Morris, because this is a prop, this is an early work of his, in fact, as well, it's kind of, um, and when I asked, wrote to ask you for an image, this is what you sent me, and I'm curious about the status of the first, earliest performances and its documentation, and if there are such photographs. Oh. Um. I've heard a rumor that there was a photographer at that at that show in 1961. I've never found the photographer. Um, and I must say that um, I would never have thought to ask a photographer to be there. Um, I think Peter Moore was already taking, maybe not yet. I think he was going to happenings, but that he hasn't picked up on the dance hasn't yet. Picked up no. on because the dance. Because he wasn't at the 1962 first Judson performance okay. either. Bob McElroy was mm -hmm. also uh, mm -hmm. more with the happenings yeah. and with the mm -hmm. dance. Yeah. But it, it never occurred to me that we needed a photograph of it. it we yeah. were doing yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that, this is a, I think this is a huge and very crucial issue because not only then are some performances undocumented by photographs, although there's other accounts, and I want to talk about how documentation also exists in the form of oral testimony and history, sort of like folklore, as was mentioned in the earlier panel. Um, but the, the photographs are hugely, obviously, valuable in terms of the kinds of information you can get from them. And to, um, to rate, just because I think it's a very important issue the truth is, it's very difficult to publish anything that Peter Moore took because um, the estate is very, very difficult to work with. So um, both of you, I think, have works that you, in some ways, don't have access to their histories because the photographs were taken by someone. You don't own those. You don't own the rights to the photographs of your own work, in some cases. And I'm really, that I think that's an. Ex that's really. Yeah, and I want to that's a whole question. So but but I, I, I do want to mention that I certainly didn't know that what I was doing was going to be important mm -hmm. um, 30, 40 years later. Mm -hmm. Do you have... Well, <laughs> yeah, sure. But, but now I, I'm, I'm glad that, that Peter Moore did recognize that, right? When did you figure that out? <laughs> I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I may have figured it out before you. When, when did you, you figure it out, Yvonne? What, what, at that, e that evening was uh, uh, important. Mm -hmm. that, that evening or, of dance constructions. That, mm -hmm. Or whatever you're saying, you figured out before me. <laughs> well, uh, it no. was an almost uh, instantly. I mean, we, we who performed with you knew that this was something very special. And... Um, um, you know, I I was eating you up without your knowing it, probably. But, uh, yeah. But I actually would like to talk a little bit about what happens when you don't. Your when a scholar comes to you, Yvonne, and says, "I'd love to um, have your photographs of We Shall Run," and you have to say, "I don't actually." I send I send them to the Getty, and yeah. then they, and then they get, get the dates wrong. <laughs> But in yeah, I don't have anything anymore. I shipped everything out. You know, I, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I, I regret it sometimes, but uh, yeah. Mm. But, but the Getty is a lot more permissive about people using those than other 
mm. photographers. Right. So, so I, I guess I just, I actually am trying to dive into the very sticky issue that a lot of people mm. refer to, but we don't always directly talk about, which is that Peter, we can't just not, can't, we can't publish these Peter Moore images. And it's a hugely important archive of all of these very important avant-garde New York art events in the 60s. And they're well, some, at some point, they're going to be in an institutional archive. And that will probably change. Yeah, yeah hopefully. I, I mean, it just was very, it's a very painful for those of us who work in that time period mm -hmm. to not be able to illustrate yeah. our arguments. So. Well, would you have advice then for a kind of um, a younger generation in terms of self-archiving? Either of you? Yeah, a videotape, a photograph, everything. Yeah, hang on to it. You never know. I mean, for your own use also. I, I go through old notebooks or, or a book, what has remained in the books of mine that have been published. I'm still uh, using stuff. I mean, a lot of the stuff, the descriptions and the scores in my first book uh, are indecipherable to me. I, I, I don't remember. So I give permission to any dance student to use it, those, that stuff the way they want. And I also tell my, uh, use it as a resource for working with my uh, present group. And uh, so, um, but I, I want to get into galleries. I, there's a particular, uh, George Machunas uh, uh, produced a show at a gallery on Madison Avenue, and you invited me to do something there. Uh, Lamont was, Lamont Young was involved. Do you remember that? I don't, but uh, I often don't. Uh, it was my first experience uh, in a gallery, and uh, all I remember is I wore black leotard and tights for no reason, and I was crawling around on the floor putting tape or something on the floor, and I don't know, you were doing something at the same time. And it, it was my first, uh, and it wasn't my first encounter with the art world. I mean, I was married to a painter, and, uh, you know, I was part of a whole bohemian thing in San Francisco. And, but um, uh, the, uh, of course, no one was paid. I mean, that was not an issue. And uh, uh, I, th I thought you might, yeah. Might remember that. I, I don't. Um, no one was paid, but times were easy. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Times were easy. That's, that's there were a yeah. lot of part-time <laughs> jobs, and you yeah. could make it on, on yeah. working three days a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I always quote you, uh, you could get a spaghetti dinner and a glass of wine for 99 cents. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, jump us forward a little bit. These are just some images I brought in in case they came up. Um, but I think I'm going to just go right to the kind of case study examples. Well, this I wanted to have Yvonne speak to a little bit because we've mentioned um, Laban and the um, idea of notation. And the, the one on the right is for Trio A. Um, and I'm curious about your relationship to this system of notation and if you have found it um, useful. Well, it was uh, notated by two... Um, what are their names? Melanie Clark and I Yalkir forget. Cole. Huh? Yalkir Cole. Yes, right. Yalkir. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, at the uh, Greenwich Dance Agency, where I taught Trio A to a group of dancers in in the late '90s, I think. Um, and uh, they sat on the floor with their uh, pencils and papers, and they notated it. <laughs> Um, several years later, I went back to the uh, uh, Laban uh, Center, and uh, uh, and I looked at uh, and and I think Melanie was t had taught it from the notation, mm -hmm. and um, well, it was very off, mm -hmm. and I, so I made corrections. She made corrections, but I think you know Laban made uh, this uh, system in relation to a musical score mm -hmm. so that the timing is uh, very important and the correspondence of music and dance is, uh, is crucial. Uh, there's no such uh, 
uh, regulatory tempo or measurements of time in, in uh, tree away. So, um, you know, that's the hardest thing to, to convey about this dance, the, the pacing of it, that one, something is always happening, no matter how simple or how complicated, uh, you keep this pace going to uh, the best of your ability. Um, so it, it's imperfect, you know, uh, as the 1978 uh, film of me doing it is imperfect. Um, as long as I am around, I will continue to teach it in more and more rigor. It's the only dance of mine that has survived in intact, right? Uh, on my body, on, on my body, yeah. I, I, I guess I read a quote of yours in an interview saying it was the sole survivor of the 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Simone, do you have a notation? Is this, I mean, how, how do you I describe, I describe um, uh, like we were looking at um, slant board mm -hmm. with, with the three performers. Um, I, I have descriptions, and uh, there's some descriptions in, in the book you referenced, uh, Handbook in Motion, but I've made more elaborate descriptions. Um, I also, um, uh, with the box gallery that uh, represents me and helps me so much to do things like, for instance, uh, I made a, we made a video of my teaching uh, all the dance constructions to, to uh, a group of students from UCLA. Um, and... Uh, and then we did the performance uh, of all the pieces. And uh, so if it takes me an hour to teach uh, slant board, we have an hour's worth of video. We did very little editing, uh, almost no editing, just how to teach it. Um, I'm thinking of uh, doing a workshop for people that I would invite or who would be really interested and I feel could handle it to learn how to teach the pieces. So um, if, if, if there's a piece somewhere at a time when I just can't go and teach it or, or don't want to for whatever reason travel at that moment or after I'm gone, um, at least for some time, um, they'll still exist. So uh, it's more like that than, uh, uh, and a description of, of the style, the attitude, um, unhurried, um, uh, the gaze, not looking in, but pretty much the same gaze you might have while you're washing dishes. Mm -hmm. um, right. A real description, yeah. how, to, how to do it. I think, I think another, another place that dance lives is, is in your, both of you have very um, beautiful verbal styles. And so the descriptions that Yvonne uses, which I know personally from teaching Tree Away, that Sarah was also describing these phrases um, about how to move your body that are very metaphoric um, but it, and very evocative and exactly what you said, Simone, about this, this way of imagining um, your body in space via analogy to other activities. I think that's another way to keep those motions vivid to us. One of the um, obvious topics that we're grappling with today is the intersection, or what Brennan and Ryan are calling the interface between the art world and the dance world. And I want to, to hear both of you talk about the 60s in which those lines were um, perhaps felt much felt very fluid, um, and think about reflect on that moment vis-a-vis -vis the the, arc, the current moment, and when dance is suddenly really popular within major institutions all over the world. Um, well, my first um, foray into uh, dancing in a museum was uh, in around 71, 70 and seventy one when the Whitney was a uh, uh, museum in New York, was producing uh, uh, events, musical events, uh, dance, uh, Phil Glass, uh, Meredith Monk, uh, Deborah Hay, and I 
uh, had two evenings. Um, um, I cannot, I was racking my brain. I, uh, this business of uh, remuneration keeps coming up and uh, there's no standards for it. Um, I don't remember, I must have, I don't remember whether this I paid This is Continuous Project Alter Daily. This is yeah. Continuous Project Yeah, Continuous Project Alter Daily. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't remember whether we were paid. I, I mean, it was, I can remember feeling, you know, uh, flattered by the attention of a, a major institution. And uh, uh, I don't think I would have paid to perform there, but um, yeah. Um, so it, it was a situation where they, um, the audience was on three sides, and there was another room uh, where I showed several films, and the audience, the, the uh, program uh, said that the audience was free to go around the perimeter and go enter this other room at any time. Uh, the the uh, form of the piece was very uh, uh, free form. Uh, there were preset uh, uh, episodes, uh, uh, increments, and then we were free to uh, instigate uh, any one of them at any time, and they would involve two people or three people. There were six performers. So that, that worked out pretty well. It was, uh, uh, and then I think the following year I did another uh, evening or series of evenings uh, uh, there. Uh, but it was a time when uh, the uh, it was like a concert situation. The, it was a particular time on a particular evening, and uh, it's more of like an event. Yeah, structure. yeah. Uh, it wasn't like during the day when there were people coming through to look at other things. Oh, what's going on there? And uh, uh, a kind of random audience, in addition to people who could come to see that. It, it was formal. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, it's very different from what I see in, in museum situations now, where the, uh, uh, even when audience is given seats, uh, well, I'm thinking of Deborah Hayes' uh, last piece at, uh, at MoMA, the audience kind of surged around and through, and uh, the dancers also, uh, uh, the space was very amorphous. Uh, uh, I, I, could, I myself couldn't imagine doing something like that. Um, and it's one reason I guess I, I turned to film. I could control that frame, mm -hmm. where you looked and what was in it and what was on the edge. And uh, uh, it was brought up in, uh, uh, in one of the earlier sessions about how Trisha used the frame of the proscenium stage in several of her early dances, which was... Uh, quite amazing, uh, no one, that, that mythical offstage uh, space where you, people disappear. I mean, it's one reason if, when I'm in a proscenium space, I always, if you're not dancing, you sit somewhere and watch. You, you're an audience. You never go off, and, uh, which may, sometimes is hard on the dancers, but uh, they can't warm up and uh, keep, keep warming up. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess still be. Simone, I'm curious about your thoughts about how the lines between art and dance felt in the '60s versus uh, compared to today. Um, well, I uh, I think also about a line between improvisers and that whole community and uh, choreographers and and um, uh, improvisers aren't as much at home on, on a stage and in a frontal situation, although they can be. Um, uh, and I was always more part of, of the improvising world. Um, and it's, it's a little more... Um, loose. Loose, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and so I was always interested in, in painting. Um, uh, I love painting. Uh, that to, as a witness, that's my favorite form. Um, 
the choreographed dance has never terribly interested me. I haven't followed it. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't felt very um, related to it. Um, so um, I also feel that somehow my early dance constructions, which are dance constructions, which are dances and sculptures at the same time, fit easily into a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, improvisation can fit easily into a museum, and I, and I just uh, did some improvisations at the uh, at, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York um, in a very interesting um, uh, mode, let's say. Uh, and and it, it was the idea of the, the person who who invited me uh, to do it in two rooms at once with a, a wall between that had, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, two rooms at once with a wall between that had space on either side. And I worked with um, a little microphone, and there was a speaker in each room so that when I was in this room, these audience members could also hear me and vice versa, so that I was traveling between those two rooms. Um, it affected my, my, my um, way of composing. I, I, I found myself doing a lot of short, brief images that then I'd go into the other room and do a lot of brief images. Uh, in a way, it was harder to go deeper into any one um, thing, let's say, that I get started. But on the other hand, it was there. There was an urgency, and it it, it, it turned out to be interesting. Uh, on Wednesday and uh, Thursday, on Friday, which was the free day, there was a lot of public that kind of poking their head in, coming in for two minutes, leaving. The guard was telling them, "No, you can't stand there. You got to sit there and move over there." And um, so that I finally said to the guard, what's your name? Because we're doing this together. <laughs> and, 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 and he kind of softened up at that point. Um, but if there's a choreographed dance, if there's a dance that's been choreographed for the stage, maybe the museum isn't the place for it. That, um, and, the, and the museum... I too was very flattered, you know, to to be in a man. I'm flattered to be here, um, but also I'm I'm flattered to be uh, it, at the box gallery. I'm I'm flattered to to uh, be at Highways Performance Space, um, or that's more like home. I'm not flattered to be at home. I'm. I, 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 <laughs> And, and in highways, it's more like I'm at home. But um, highways, by the way, really amazing uh, performance venue in San Juan. That's been going for decades, and that you know brings in you know people who you know are have been doing important work for a long time, and also people who are doing their first thing. Um, and so it, it's it, it feels good to to work there because I respect them and I respect how they do and what they do as I respect the museum. But uh, it's not that a choreographed dance is left out or overlooked by the museum uh, community uh, if, if it's not brought into the museum unless it fits well in the museum. Um, one of the things I just showed, um, you don't have to talk about it, Simone, is uh, news animation, a, a very... Um, I think it's an actually beautiful photograph of a improvisation with the news, with newspapers. But I'm going to quickly, because um, I want to open it out to the audience, I'm going to show, um, oh, I wanted to maybe ask Simone a very quick question about your relationship to drawing, which these are two drawings um, that you've done. One of them is an animal breathing, because I know you're very inspired by animal motions. My improvisations are always in relation to something that I'm exploring and studying. Um, the animal drawings, I, I've done a lot of animal drawings as I, to help me understand 
movement to help me understand movement of my body with my structure compared to movement of another body with a different structure. And um, I did a lot of studying how to get from crawling to standing and back to crawling or with my limbs out to the sides like a, like a reptile and, and that the, the, the spine then moves this way uh, r rather than this way. Um, a lot of drawings with that. With, with, with the circle drawings, um, I was at that time working with a composer, musician, Charlemagne Palestine, and he was uh, working with, uh, with sound waves, and I was working with um, trajectory. Um, I was working with centrifugal and centripetal forces, and, and with uh, going in a large circle, and with how a tilt of balance would change the trajectory of the curve. And so I... I, I These are very dancerly. Dancer this was struck me as a very dancerly dancer drawing. It. Yeah, it's done by hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna show um, a whole series of images of Trio A in different contexts, and then I'm gonna show some of Huddle because I want to spend a little bit of time on those how those two dances in particular have been become so you know canonical and re, um, revisited. Um, so just bear with me, Yvonne. <laughs> So, enough, enough, right? No, never, never enough. enough. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like you get this kid that, 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 that made it, and you've got to go to all the performances. That you have. <laughs> this is um, the, the, the film that, I, that we've already heard that um, Yvonne doesn't love. Um, I mean, it's fine with it being shown, as you just said, but it has, it's not a um, very accurate document of the dance itself. This is a very interesting performance by an artist named Lindsay Lawson who um, had a dancer perform sort of alongside or in front of a projection of the film and then it was a trio which was the film the dancer's body and then the shadow that she was casting um, where was that that I think that she's an LA artist oh. she's here Lindsay Lawson no <laughs> Um, there's the debut performance, which um, is an image by Peter Moore, which so I'm showing all the Peter Moore images I can because I can't ever publish them. And then I've shown this to you before, Yvonne, and you were very puzzled, but this is Trio A being performed on the internet in Second Life, where people, um, avatars learned it. Yeah, which is really amazing. Yeah, so it is, I mean, it really, it talk about the afterlives, it has had so many different iterations, kind of unimaginable ones. So you didn't even know, Yvonne, about this Lindsay Lawson? You didn't, you didn't no. know? Right, so um, a few more. Well, yes, uh, one from Tate Britain, and then of course, uh, one very close to my own heart because I was in this performance with Simon Lung, who's here, um, and Rachel, who was an undergrad, um, also at that's right. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think that's, that's it for Trio A, but I, I just wanted to ask you, Yvonne, if you think, if you have any speculative understanding of why this four and a half minute dance of all your you know over 40 choreographies has become so indelible it it survived yeah yeah it's a, uh, like uh, the ultimate trace of a career uh, yeah uh, but do you have I mean any uh, any do you have any reflections on why that might be so why this as compared to some other four and a half minutes. I mean, to me, I'll just say that I think it's um, wonderful, but also surprising given how actually very difficult it is. Yeah, well, that, that's another issue. I mean, people think it, it's easy mm -hmm. because I, I don't know why. They think I don't know why. Easy. I think that yeah. is so, why I did yeah. And they think they can learn it from that video, right. which is on, has been taken off of YouTube several times and always gets put back. Um, uh, the, you can't, uh, the, the video does not show you the space and uh, the depth and the floor patterns and uh, yeah and and the somehow the uh, the details don't register to even trained dancers who watch and learn dance and movement yeah it's it's strange um, so um, 
Yeah, why do uh, why has it uh, achieved this iconic status? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Your guess is what's what, what do you think? Right. I've thought, I've thought, thought a lot. I mean, I've wondered about this a lot. I think part of it actually is that it's difficult. So I think people have a sense of achievement, when, and then hence they want to promote it or teach it. Or I think there's some there's something about the difficulty. Paradoxically, is part of its endurance. Um, I think that's one part. I think it's also very misleading when it's characterized as being. I mean, there isn't even tempo to it, but it does have its climaxes. You know, and it is. I think very. Um, I think there is something very, there is a trajectory that it traces that is very satisfying for the viewer. I mean, that's my experience. And very satisfying for the dancer. I think the freestanding handstand, you know, just the whole ending gestures, there is a sense of conclusion there. So I think maybe it does, it feels complete in itself in a way that an excerpt of something else might not. That's one speculation I have. Yeah, and, and I, I think, think it's, it's flexibility. flexibility. I think the fact that, as Sarah was saying, you don't need music or a set or a costume. I mean, all of those things have made... And it's also, you can do it by yourself. You don't have to rely... Or you can do it in groups. So I think there's all these different interesting malleabilities that might have happened. And you've taught it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right, that's true. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. So I think we also have some access to your thought process there, which really helps cement, you know, the somewhat abstract motions to your intentions in some way. So I want to move on to um, to Huddle, which we also just saw. Um, and these are just a few photographs. And I want to read a quote, um, Simone, that these are... This is, these are great. I think it's such a photogenic piece. It's like really amazingly, um, it really is very vibrant in photographs. So this is you. Huddle has a double life. In the art world, it's a sculpture to be seen. In the improvisational dance world, it's a collective experience. There's an interest now in my dance constructions, but I made them in a very brief period of my life in my 20s. For me, that need for a drier, minimalist expression lasted only a few years. I soon got back to exploring movement from various points of view, partaking of what I call the dance state, an immersion in somatic responses to inner or outer stimuli, a joy in moving. And I think this idea of the double life is very intriguing, that it actually, people actually see different things when they look at it, depending on what, um, tra- you know, what, what lenses they have. And I'm wondering if you could say more about that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, uh, I, th- I, th- I think for dancers it's something to do uh, and to experience, and, and uh, especially what it feels like to be underneath uh, where uh, the lines of, of, of weight uh, of the body that's, that's climbing across get uh, passed around from limb to limb. You don't even know which 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 limb it's going through. So it starts on the one person's shoulder and then ends up on, on, on the thigh of the next person and, and then down into the ground. And then there are all these adjustments so that it's almost um, an experience of a reflex, body reflex, passing through a group. Uh, and then the one who's on top um, the experience of just, you just have to go for it. You just step on someone's thigh and pull at someone's shoulder and, 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 and climb over this, this medium that you seldom climb over like that. Of course, contact improvisation is, is working your body in a, me- in a particular medium. Uh, like swimming, you're working in water. Um, uh, in contact improvisation, you're working in with another body. You're working in flesh. In flesh in and bone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, one thing I uh, I love about uh, huddle is that again, you you don't need to build things. You don't need costumes. And what has happened is that anyone who's done the huddle. Um, is welcome to try a huddle wherever they travel, wherever they go, <laughs> if, if they teach a workshop. 
So Hadl has this life of its own. Um, I, I often like envied Steve Paxton, uh, his, his um, relationship to uh, contact improvisation that he was uh, really the beginning of and the beginning of teaching it and that it's all over the world and it has a life of its own. Um, he never copyrighted it. He, he never, never copyrighted it. And, and they, they talked about whether to, at, at first, whether to um, give, there's a word for it, when a certain person uh, uh, graduates and, and can teach something, whether to do that. And they decided instead of doing that to start a newsletter and to start the culture of people who do contact improvisation to write uh, reports about how they're doing it, what they're thinking about, uh, the discourses around it. And that's the Contact Quarterly, now Journal of Improvisation and Dance, I think it's called. Uh, so that, that um, cultural, political way of being in the world, um, and some things can do that. Um, uh, Huddle can do its little way of doing that. Contact improv does it in a big way. Um, not every uh, slant board certainly couldn't do it. There's stuff to be built there. Yeah, I'm thinking we should open it to the audience. I see a hand way there. There's mics. Microphone. Hi. Yvonne. Hi, Simon. Uh, I wanted to go back to the question of um, the body as archive versus notation. Uh, the, the question of notation uh, as we envision it in this discussion is very marked historically because you were uh, choreographing or designing uh, dance at the time uh, before video. Now we can have a cat doing something cute and without uh, somebody taking it on the cell phone and so forth. But there was an urgency. Uh, there is this uh, modern dance, this Chinese modern dance choreographer, one way who has really used uh, the, the concept of body as archive. And she branches out into also the archive of uh, national trauma. She's done a lot of work on uh, the memories of the Cultural Revolution, which is the time she was growing up, and I think the two can be connected together. But um, the, the, you, you both talked about the imperfection of the kind of notations that are done in the 60s, which is a problem we had in common with musicians. Cage and uh, David Berman and these kind of people had written a lot about the difficulty of uh, creating notations for the kind of musical experiment that we had at the time. Now, um, if I may, Yvonne, I'm going to share a little anecdote. When you and I were in La Rochelle together, Where? The La Rochelle, um, there was this group of uh, French <coughs> dancers, uh, I forgot the name of the group, but it was Kristen Waverley, who the were reconstructed. for Albrecht Nust? Yeah, that, yeah, that's it, the Quatuor Nust, thank you. And they were doing a uh, reconstruction of the dances of the Jetson. Uh, based on your books, notations, and so forth. And we attended one of his performances. And uh, you suddenly stood up and you said, that's not the way it was done. And you went on stage. Oh, really? and, and so <laughs> so there was here the very pure no, no, conflagration. No, 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 I have to interject. Okay, 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 okay go ahead. Yeah. Correcting. Uh, it, well, I didn't correct. I was in the audience and I thought, Oh my God, I just remembered something. Yeah. And, and you I went, went on stage yeah. and you went on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And I taught it to, uh, yeah. it wasn't so you that they were doing it wrong. <laughs> and, and so there was, it was a very powerful moment, completely improvised, experiential, to use a word that, was, that uh, never happened again. Uh, but that was very clearly the, 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 the difference between what could be uh, passed on through notation and even around memory, because they had studied a lot, and you, your body suddenly remembering. Mm. And so uh, I would like you to comment on this, uh, these different ways that dance can be archived <gasps> and passed on, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I'm open. It's funny. I'm open to uh, imperfections when I'm present. <laughs> um, for instance, um, today, Sarah Wookie and I, uh, um, Sarah has just recently mastered the left side, doing trio A on the left side, the mirror image uh, reversed. And we weren't sure, she wasn't sure whether she would be able to carry it off today. And we had one rehearsal, and when she was in Australia, she worked on it. And uh, so I said, well, uh, just stop, or we'll talk about it. Or uh, as in rehearsal, she would ask me a question. I'd stop what I was doing and go, I mean, that is very acceptable to me. And, and I, I found, you know, I, uh, two days ago, I did a... Pr pretty, by my standards, a pretty decent trio A. I, I'm nervous, you know, I'm not used to performing in front of a, a bunch of people. So uh, I found myself, especially in this, I was a little better in the second one, you know, I was shaky, I, I couldn't find my legs. Okay, uh, let it hang out, you know, uh, show, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're all sympathetic with an old, an old lady doing this dance where it's hard to get up and down off the floor. And, uh, um, so, um, yeah, and uh, I, I feel that way about a, a lot of performance, especially the stuff I do with my group, like uh, we would, I don't know, whether this is a tangent that's relevant or not, but uh, uh, I had three nights at Dance Space in January and uh, uh, a new dance that had never been performed and uh, 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 the one before. Um, and uh, I was supposed to, uh, uh, assisted living good sports too, it's called. I, I was supposed to come out uh, with everyone else and have a mic. I forgot to bring the mic out. And so I told the audience, well, okay. And then I go get the mic, and, uh, and I can't turn it on. I mean, I haven't examined it before. The red light is on. What's wrong with this thing? I, I can't turn it on. So I called the, you know, so this, this kind of thing happens. People think, oh, it's deliberate, because she showed in her process, you know. <laughs> 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 you could get away with anything. Huh? I said you could yeah, get away with anything. Well, uh, yeah, in a way, it's about getting away with murder. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to tie this up with your. Uh, yeah. Can you tie it up, Bernice? <laughs> the body as archive. Mm -hmm. The, the dance stored in, in your body. Yeah. And the, 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 the incredible difficult task that these dances had in the 60s of, of finding an, an accurate mm -hmm. mode of oh. notation. Mm -hmm. Now, I just thought of something else. The difference between my performance and yours, you, you cannot do anything wrong. Mm. You know? <laughs> no, no, really. So, no. I mean, I go to your performances. You make something of everything that's happening, right? And me, uh, the geriatric version of Trio A, which I now have done a few times, uh, I mean, the previous time I talk about it while I'm doing it, um, uh, it's a mistake, a, a failure of the body. The memory is in the body. Sure, the memory is there. The muscles uh, don't cooperate, right? So, um, I mean, it's very interesting about... Uh, memory. You are recreating it every time. Well, yeah. I'm reinventing it but every time. what for me is doing something wrong is when the improvisation isn't going anywhere. And that can happen. By, by your uh, standards. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. With another person or when you're alone? Either. Uh -huh. I, I was thinking more when I'm alone. I'm, uh -huh. more, I'm more aware of it. Uh -huh. But yeah, sometimes it's like Simone, you know. Uh, <laughs> get with it. <laughs> get with it. Get with it, you know. I think, I yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty question. risky. I mean, we're di oh. I'm describing two different kinds of risks. Here. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I was going to ask just to bring back this issue of dance in an institutional venue, like a museum. 
But it bringing it back to thinking about the 60s and wondering if um, Judson actually became, even in that decade, almost seen as an institution, because I've read stuff about, you know, Warhol ends up there watching some performances and people like that. Um, so did anybody actually begin to see that space as almost, as if you created almost an institution there? I mean, in some ways you did, and especially in the way that literature is about today. But what's your perspective on that in terms of it? Well, and how does it, does that relate to all the museums? What by an institution? When does something become an institution? When it has a board of directors? Uh, right. <laughs> well, it's, it sort of did, right? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it already was an institution. Yeah. It's part of the Baptist uh, National Organization, yeah. and uh, it had been uh, operating. Uh, Howard Moody had been there for a couple of years and doing amazing things with uh, draft dodgers and uh, abortion counseling and uh, um, uh, yeah, decriminalization of prostitution. They were into a lot of social uh, activism and showing uh, the work for the first time of Oldenburg and Whitman and um, Dine, Dine, probably. Dine, yeah, yeah. Is your question more that uh, about the Judson as having its own set of rules and a kind of um, an influence that grew ever greater? And that, e that is that your question? Yeah, I guess I'm wondering compared to how we're talking about it today in terms of dance being a museum today. Mm -hmm. um, not that Judson was a museum, obviously, but is the space in any way similar in that, yeah, there are these boards and, and these sort of, um, you know, administration involved? You know, um, um, I have a question. Um, uh, what was the process for getting to do something in one of those evenings? Oh, um, uh, after the first concert, um, we started this weekly workshop in the gymnasium of the church. And uh, we decided that anyone who came to the workshop could show their work. And uh, no matter, there was no, uh, uh, there was no judgment. I mean, you might have thought something was pretty silly, and I did. Uh, but, um, and there was a committee of three people who organized the concerts. And it, it was, uh, people were nominated or volunteered. I was on one of those committees. Alex Hay, I remember I worked with. And uh, uh, we, we organized it in terms of, uh, uh, expediency and uh, what would follow what technically uh, and uh, that's how they came off. N now the way it's run, uh, uh, Movement Research has these Monday nights and uh, you have to apply. I don't know what the process is. Uh, every Monday night there's a free concert. Uh, um, so that sounds very different from a museum structure to me in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Did anyone have a question I saw in Sabina? Um, Yvonne, in response to the first question about the body as archive, you said, I think, that imperfection is okay if you're around. Mm -hmm. You said that imperf you can accept oh, imperfection yeah. if you're yeah. around. Yeah. But I don't know if you finished that thought. Um, <laughs> that is to say, the implication being that you want perfection when you're not around. <laughs> <laughs> well, does the tree make a sound when it falls? And no one is there. I don't know. Um, um, oh, in terms of Trio A, uh, well, I, I have absolute trust in the people who I have uh, given permission to teach and perform the dance. So I, I don't worry about that. You know. And I know that you use the word transmission. It's Sarah uh, used it. Yeah, I learned it from, from Sarah. I never used to use that word. Um, and it seems like, um, and I think this is connected to the archive question, that is, one way of thinking about preservation of dance is transmission mm. uh, rather than notational mm. Um, mm. record or something mm. like that. And um, I'm wondering whether... The, the call out to the museum, perhaps, if the museum is interested in collecting dance now, is to take on the work of transmission. And maybe the dancer 
artist has to think about that dimension when the knock on the door comes from MoMA that they would like to buy a dance so that it can't be just notations, it may be mechanisms of transmission that now you have to figure out. Well, we should all look to Tino Sigal, who has evidently figured that all out. I, I don't know how. I, I want to say something about Huddle, um, that it's out in the world yeah. as its dance part of dance construction. If it's to be shown in a museum, then it has to be taught by me or by someone who, who I, I trust to teach it. And so far, there, there are two people that I took, um, uh, Claire Filmon and Sarah Swenson, I, I trust to teach it. Uh, when, when my transmitters, <laughs> teachers, what, what, is, what is this transmission? Um, when uh, the people who I've authorized to teach it go out, they go out with a contract uh, that people sign, uh, because usually they, you know, 60 hours it takes to really master this dance, and uh, they never are given that amount of time. So the, uh, the students sign a contract saying they will not perform it or teach it without further, without permission from me. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it, um, did Sina, do you want to, I think we have time for one more question. Oh, and then. Okay. Yeah, I think we can imagine uh, places like Chats and other places where a lot of projects emerge as imaginary museums, and the question is how they enter the so called material museum and what the materiality again, the, the core subject of, of these type of works is. And uh, as a matter of fact, at MoMA, I had several conversations and one project was with Simone, how to acquire these type of works, not only in a way to reconstruct or document them, but also how to keep them alive uh, in a way of uh, building knowledge, how to teach them, and regularly how to perform them. But this, of course, leads the museum in an entirely new direction. It is really challenging, and this definitely would require the collaboration with dance organizations and, and, and all kinds of things. But I think it's an interesting idea which um, uh, has also cases in all other type of works, if you again think back to conceptual art practices. So it's, it's not solely a problem in dance type of works, I think. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, since I'm sitting next to you, <laughs> I think my follow-up to that would be you talked to Julia about it, this idea of the two lives of Huddle, for instance, and certainly JOA has a pedagogical life mm -hmm. in addition to its life as an artwork, as something to be seen. It's also something to be learned and has a use value, I'd say, within the dance field for dancers. It's a cash cow. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, even for those of us who don't become transmitters, mm -hmm. but just learn it, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of people have learned it for the sake of learning it and huddle too. I wonder what happens, actually, maybe this is more a question for you, Sabina. If a museum collects the work, how does the work continue to exist mm -hmm. in its other life, its double life, as a pedagogical tool? How does, how does it get to be performed? And does it have to be authorized by the Museum of Modern Art to be done at the World Arts and Culture's Dance Department? To be taught. To be taught to, be taught to happen all. in the studio. Uh -huh. Simone and I already discussed this, and I hope the museum goes on with that. Even if I'm not there, maybe it's good to talk about it now, <laughs> so who listens? Uh, that, uh, that's one reason why she documents the teaching process and performing was actually for the MoMA project and to create sort of an archive of several media, drawings, and all kinds of things which would be part of these uh, things to be acquired and to, to bring to life once in a while hopefully very often. And I think there, I mean, this is probably not a sort of recipe for all kind of works. I mean, Yvonne, you, you might have... Okay, okay. Let's, yeah. let's take a hypothetical. Okay. Uh, I, I want to sell, or MoMA comes to me and wants to buy Trio A. Okay, right? let's do that. Then. Okay, <laughs> so I, I think I would set limitations. They can buy it to be taught for performance in the museum. And they have no rights beyond that, mm -hmm. right? Licensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, it, it's, it's licensing. licensing. I, I mean, we already see that, for example, with video, mm -hmm. between their two traditions, so the, the distribution mm -hmm. of video art in the art world, there's the Electronic Arts Intermix mm -hmm. video data bank tradition that comes out of the sort of first moment of video art in the 70s, which, which is unlimited edition videos which are not owned as content or as objects, but which are licensed for specific kinds of use. Mm -hmm. And then now, subsequently, they've developed, of course, a limited edition uh, form of distribution of, of, of art videos where they're treated much more like objects and where ownership implies a whole range of other rights, although generally not copyrights, which remain with the artist. But I think it's important to get into that kind of detail about what sort of objectification and materialization we're talking about and what kinds of rights are transferred and retained, which of course is one of the so central issues. So do you get anything when the, a particular institution shows, shows? Andre. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm looking at you. I know, I know, I know. I was joking. Huh? I put myself on the spot, yeah. Oh. <laughs> do I get what? Uh, do you get a, uh, uh, a royalty? Yeah, right, royalty. Well, I, I mean, I personally distribute videos on both models, mm. whereas with an unlimited edition video, the purchasing institution has limited rights for public performance, mm -hmm. duplication, and very limited distribution rights. I mean, you probably encountered this with film, Yvonne, right? Well, with my films, yeah, yeah, yeah right. sure. Yeah. And then there are other kinds of things that are distributed mm -hmm. in different terms, and of course, Different terms or arrangements may or may not be appropriate for different kinds of works because it not only determines the form of distribution, but I think also trans can transform the meaning of the work in very, very significant ways. Yeah. I think there was one, let's take one more question. change slides to some of your Thank you. recent work. Hold on. This may be too big a question for the end, but you began with a really interesting conversation about 1958 and the distinction between the open scoring of improvisational work and of conceptual work. And I wondered what the dual nature of your very distinct styles was on the visual art movement between 1958 and the beginning of Judson. How did your thinking about dance influence visual artists? And I realize I'm speaking to two visual artists. I didn't totally understand the question, but it wasn't. What was it about the nature of your work that influenced other forms of art other than dance? Oh. Well, I'm going to put this, uh, Simone, it's, again, it's so awkward for me to show things that you can't really see, but I have a picture of Angel, your, that's a, kind of a sculpture, if this thing will go back. Well, that, that's, that's from 76. Um, see, it's sort of, I got it. <laughs> that, my date encompasses that year. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, I, I, I was married to Robert Morris for, for a number of years. We were living in um, San Francisco. He was making uh, very large abstract expressionist paintings. And I, w which, well, no, his weren't so much action painting, but large abstract expressionist paintings. And in a way, I was using large abstract expressionist movement with Anna Halperin. Um, oh, we, of course, talked a lot about what we were doing, what we were seeing, what were, was interesting to us. And um, we moved to New York, uh, I think mainly at that moment, because Bob had to see the paintings that, that he was being influenced by and, and, and seeing reproductions of uh, de Kooning and Klein and so on. Um, but there was also a feeling of, of not, uh, something was changing. Uh, 
I think generally in, in, in the community of abstract expressionism. Uh, I somehow came up with, uh, okay, I'm telling a story. Um, Lamont Young invited me into a series of performances and, uh, okay, it's getting more complicated. I had seen uh, photographs of the work of the Japanese Gutai um, painters and sculptors who were um, uh, in the 50s uh, extending their, their work in painting and sculpture into environments and then doing actions in the environments. And when, when I was invited by Lamont Young to present something, um, I, I, my mind turned to the Gutai and, and I made huddle very much um, feeling that it was in the style of the Gutai work. Um, and Bob Morris too, I mean, we were looking at those photographs. And uh, I remember uh, making sketches of, of the slant board and of some other pieces with ropes hanging from the ceilings, and that was all great. I made these sketches of things I wanted to do. And then I thought, how am I going to, how am I going to build this board? I don't know how to build anything. And, and Bob said, I'll build them for you. And I think that that, 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 that influenced him quite a bit, or he you know, he would acknowledge that, that uh, then he continued working uh, with, with that imp impetus of having built those boxes, those ropes, those slant board. And the, the platform? Mm -hmm. The platform, the boxes. Um, um, so I, 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 there, I don't know, I wondered why abstract expressionism kind of came to a screeching halt. Mm -hmm. And, 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 um, and um, a minimalism came in, kind of like, oh, that's what I've been waiting for. What a relief. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that seems we a decent place to end. Right, I just want to very quickly say that I put this comparison up just because I was thinking also about alternative modes of um, mediating or representing the body, including fragmentation and miniaturization and things that both of you have dealt with in, in various ways. But I want to thank you both, um, not only for this conversation, but for your many decades of completely amazing work. Thank you.